audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. God wants to open the windows of heaven and bless you. He loves you. He's already proven that by sending his son to die for you and secured your salvation through the blood of Jesus. He wants to pour out blessings on you, but he's not going to allow you to violate the first fruits principle and still open up the windows of heaven because he's not an enabler. Today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines. We are taking the gospel to the world. Pastor, apologist, and Bible teacher. One truth that will be delivered in love and compassion, connecting every one person to all that God has promised them. You make me want to dance and sing with every single breath I breathe. I will bring this offering. You are my wonder. You bring the wonder. Today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines. Hello and welcome. This is Today with Jeff Vines. Who wants a blessed life? Well, that's the question Pastor Jeff starts out with in this new message from a new series called The Blessed Life. He'll go on to unpack what he means by a blessed life and share with us about first fruits. Stay with us now as Pastor Jeff reminds us of the call God has put on our lives to give back to Him. Uh, who, who wants a blessed life? <laughs> who, who wants God to open up the windows of heaven and just pour out his blessings all over your life? Anybody? I mean, on your family, on your relationships, on your marriage, on your finances. Don't you wish God could kind of take two $10 bills in the back room and just kind of do what he did with the loaves and fishes and just multiply? I mean, come on. Now, you, you guys know me long enough to know that I'm not a health, wealth, prosperity guy. That, that, that means that I don't believe that... Uh, that if you're a believer in Jesus, that nothing bad's ever going to happen to you. That's just not the way it works. Uh, and, and time and history would show that that's just not true, that God has a calling on our lives sometimes. It requires enormous sacrifice, and we're not promised a bed of roses, and we're not promised an escape hatch to get away from all the things that happen in the world because of free will decisions of other people. But what I want to talk about this week is very unique to us right here, and that is that even though even though I'm not a health, wealth, prosperity guy, there are passages in the Bible that very clearly communicate that there is a God in heaven who wants to open the windows of heaven and pour out his blessings on every area of your life as a child of God. Now, uh, if you think about it, Jesus came to do two things. One is to redeem us, right? Bring us back into right relationship with God the Father. But the other that is seldom talked about, but you find all through the New Testament, is he came as a revealer. He wanted to reveal to us what God is like. You with me? So if you want to know, what is God like? The the creator, sustainer, I mean, what is he like? Jesus said, look into my face. As a matter of fact, Paul used a very powerful verse in 2 Corinthians when he said, if you want to see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, look, you'll find it in the face of Christ Jesus, our Lord. If you want to know what God is like, one of the primary metaphors, the the most popular symbol Jesus used to describe what God was like or is like is that of a father who desperately wants to bless his children. You with me? A father who desperately wants to bless his children. As a matter of fact, in Matthew 7, I was going to have you turn to that just in a few moments. uh, Jesus goes through this dialogue and he says, imagine you think you're a good father. You're nothing like my father in heaven. He says, which of your fathers, this is out of Matthew 7, verse 10, if your son asked for a fish, would give him a snake instead? This is the word, uh, it's like a barbet. It's an ill-like creature, about five feet long, no scales, inedible. How many of you fathers, if your child asked for a fish, you'd give him a snake right out of the Sea of Galilee? He says, or if, a, if he asked for an egg, would give him a scorpion. It, uh, a scorpion, when he rolls himself up, looks like an egg. How many of you fathers, if your child said, give me an egg, would give him a scorpion? Would you do that? That's usually not the heart of the parent. Parents aren't usually like that. In verse 9, he says, which of you, if his son asked for bread, would give him a stone? In the first century, uh, bread looked a lot like a big rock. So how many of you dads would say, hey, son, you're hungry? You want some bread? Have some bread. And you give him a stone. Jesus says, you're not like that. And then he says, if you then, though you are evil. Now, that's not the truth about us, the whole truth, but compared to God... 
We're not righteous, right? So he says, if you fathers on earth, if you're evil in comparison to God, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does your father in heaven know how to give good gifts to his children? You with him? He's saying that if you want to know what God is like, God is like this. A father in heaven who wants to open up the windows of heaven and pour out his blessings on all his children, on every area. John Ortberg said it like this. I remember reading this in the late 90s. He said, far more than you want your prayers answered, God longs to give wonderful things to every one of his children. Now, before we get into this, and before you think you know where it's going, let me distinguish between three types of blessings that we find in the Bible. The first blessing is that of salvation. Now, here's the thing about salvation. It's a blessing, but it's a gift, isn't it? There's nothing you did to earn it. It's a gift given to you by God. That is a blessing. It is the ultimate blessing because all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Ephesians chapter 2 says that salvation is by grace through faith. This not of yourselves, but it is a gift of God. So that's enough rejoicing right there. You've got a blessing from God. You did nothing to earn it. It is a gift given to you. Now, there's a second category of blessings, and that's what we call common blessings. Those are blessings that we receive in our lives, no matter who we are, righteous, unrighteous, wicked, Christian, unbeliever, Hindu, Muslim, whatever we are, there are blessings that are in God's created scenario that we all enjoy. Sunshine, the rain, chocolate, (laughs) coffee. You know, these are blessings that are in this created scenario. You didn't do anything to earn those. These are things just part and partial to God's world. You get to enjoy the sunshine, the rain. Jesus puts it like this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. He, meaning God, causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So salvation is a gift from God. There are common everyday gifts that everyone receives because of the goodness and graciousness of God. But then there's this third category. It's the category of what are called positioned blessings. That is, there are places you can put yourself. There's positions that you can assume that God, when you place yourself in that position, will open up the windows of heaven and pour down his blessings on you on whatever area of your life that you want to receive the blessing. Now, you have to stay with me here. You got to have a little trust and not try to predict where you think this sermon is going to go. You got to stay with me till the end. Because it all begins, as we start this series, The Blessed Life, it all begins by putting God first. When you put God first in any category of your life, the blessing from God, the promise from God is that he will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on you. Now, I want to go back to this original passage, all the way back to Genesis, and this is something that you're going to see, this scenario, right from creation Five, six hundred years before the Mosaic Law ever came into existence, right through the Mosaic Law, right into the book of Malachi, right into the Gospels, right through the Pauline Epistles and the book of Revelation. Throughout the Bible, you see this over and over again, that there is a God who is a loving Father who wants to open the windows of heaven to those who will position themselves and pour out blessings on them. It goes back, really, to this passage in Genesis. We're in the Garden of Eden. The Bible says, in the course of time, We're out of the garden, but we're in the first family. In the course of time, this is a Hebrew phrase that means when he got around to it. You with me? When he got around to it, Cain brought some of the fruits. It doesn't say first fruits. Some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions. Now, if you're a Hebrew and you read that, oh, that's the very best. If you've ever had a steak, you know the fat gives the flavor. These are the fat portions from some of the firstborn. Of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. And what did he do? He killed his brother. Now, do you notice the contrast from the get go? This is long before any law comes into being. This is the expectation God had among his people. And it was this one brother did what? He gave, not with intentionality, but ultimately what was left over when he got around to it. The other brother gave with intentionality. He set it aside, gave the very best portions, the fat portions, and he gave the first fruits of what God had supplied. Now, just to make sure, don't turn me off now. You think you know where this sermon is going. Stay with me. When he gets to the book of Exodus, God wants to make sure his people understand this principle that he is setting in place. 
So in Exodus, we're down to chapter 13, verse 12. God says directly, consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is mine. Whose is it? Mine, he says, God's. Now, what he's saying here is when the little you lamb has the first little lamb, that lamb goes to me in recognition that everything ultimately comes from me. And then all the little lambs after that, you keep for yourself, but give me the first one. Now there are exceptions to this. You find it in the next verse. He says, but every firstborn donkey, you shall redeem of the lamb. God says, don't bring me your donkeys. Don't want your donkeys. And all the firstborn of man among your sons, you shall redeem. He said, don't bring me your children. Don't bring a child to me to sacrifice to me. I'm not that kind of God. So if you have a donkey, I want you to redeem the donkey with a lamb, spotless lamb. And if you have a son or a daughter, the firstborn from the mother's womb, I don't want the child. I just want you to give me a firstborn, blameless, spotless lamb as a sign that you acknowledge that every good and perfect gift is from me, from your father in heaven above. Now, the principle behind the idea of the firstborn was this. It gave the people of Israel a way to demonstrate outwardly what they said they believed internally, that everything in the world belongs to God, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, and that all their possessions come from God. And God says, as a way of acknowledging that, I want you to do one of two things. One, you can give to me the firstborn, and then you get to keep all the rest. Or if it's a donkey or a child or something sacred, redeem it with a lamb. And there was no third option. It was one of the two. Now, the reason God instituted this among his people was because that God knew this whole thing would require faith. And in God's mind, the one thing he wants to do with all of you is build your faith and trust so much in him that no matter what happens in your life, you stand firm, you stand strong, and you know God is large and in charge. So in Hebrews chapter 11, verse six, that famous statement says, and without faith, it is impossible to do what? Please God. So when the little you lamb had the first lamb, when you gave that lamb to God, you were trusting God to redeem the rest. You had no idea how many more little lambs the little you lamb would have. So when you say, God, I give you the first, you're trusting God to supply the rest. Now notice God does not say, after the ewe produces 10 lambs or 12 lambs, give me one after you think you don't need any more. He says, no, you give me the first, and if you give me the first, here's what I'll commit to you. I will redeem the rest. Give me the first, and I will redeem the rest. Now you think about what happened on the cross. Let's go all the way to the gospel. I told you this cord runs all the way through the Bible. Go to the gospel. Jesus was God's what? Firstborn. God gave his firstborn to us, and because he gave the firstborn to us, the rest of us were what? Redeemed. All who would call on the name of the Lord. Have you ever wondered why the early church met on the first day of the week? Why a 1,500-year tradition changed almost overnight from Saturday to the first day of the week as the Christians started to meet? And you say, well, yeah, I know that. It's because Jesus rose from the dead on the third day, which was the first day on Sunday. So the Lord's day became the first day of the week. Yeah, you'd be right in that except this. God could have caused Jesus to rise from the dead any day of the week. Why choose the first day? Because he still, he is still emphasizing this first fruits principle so that we as Christians would come and give him the first day of our lives of the week so that he would redeem the other six. First fruits, firstborn, first day. And it goes on and on all throughout the scripture. As a matter of fact, in Exodus 23, 19, he wants to make sure it's not only the firstborn, but the first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. And then he goes on to say, honor the Lord. This is a powerful passage in Proverbs because Proverbs is just a way of living. It's not specific to the Israelites. It's just a way of living for those who follow God. Honor the Lord with all your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase so that, so there's a connection, your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. So there's a direct correlation between your willingness to give God the first fruits. Now, let me just put you at ease. We're not merely talking about money here, folks. We're talking about the first of your talents, 
the first of your abilities that God has given you. Some of you are entrepreneurs, some of you are plumbers, electricians, some of you are school teachers. I don't know what it is that you do, but part of the first fruits of what God has given you, he gave you that talent and ability. And the first fruits of that is to be used somehow for Christ's kingdom and his purposes. And when you do that, he promises to redeem the rest. Same is true about your money, obviously. There's the first fruits, there's the tithe. If you give God what is rightfully his, he promises to redeem the rest. If you give them the first of your week, he promises to redeem the rest. Without that, the hand of blessing does not come. Now, I want you to get this in your mind. This is the one phrase I want you to remember from this weekend as we start this series, The Blessed Life. Here it is. Give God the first and he will redeem the rest. He will secure. He will, he will keep. He will bless. Give God the first and he will redeem the rest. Let's say it together on the count of three. One, two, three. Give God the first and he will redeem the rest. Say it one more time. Give God the first and he will redeem the rest. It's almost like God is saying this. Talk is cheap. I want to know outwardly that what you say you believe inwardly is true. And you can do that by saying, God, I know that everything comes from you. I want to honor you. The origin of every good thing I have originates from you. And because I believe that, I'm going to give you the first things of every area of my life and trust you to redeem, save, and bless the rest. The principle is true on Sunday worship. On firstborn, first fruits, and the first cities conquered by Israel. Think about it. Remember the story of Jericho? Walls came tumbling down. Anybody want to sing it? Probably not. Walls came tumbling down, and they're ready to go in and take the city. And God says, whoa, hold on there just one second. And he gives them this instruction. When you go in to take the city, because it is the first city that you're going to take on your way to the promised land, there's going to be nine others. When you take this city... I want you to go in and get the gold and the silver and all the precious stuff there. And I don't want you to take any of it. All of it comes into the temple and the place of worship for the Lord. All of it. You understand? And they said, we got it. Now, why did he do that? He didn't do that with any of the other cities. Why Jericho? Because Jericho was the first city conquered on the way to the promised land. And God is saying, again, the first belongs to me. You give me the first, all the rest you can have. And so... He gave him clear instruction. He didn't tell them, conquer 10 cities and give me what you think you don't need. He did not say, give me, oh, city number eight or nine and we'll split the difference on the rest. No, he said, give me the first and you can have all the rest. Give me the first and I will redeem the rest. Save, prosper, protect. But that's not what happened if you know the story. Do you remember the story? God gave him clear instruction. Verse 18 out in the book of Joshua says this, but keep away from the devoted things. Now this is an important word. Wow. Now he calls them devoted. These things that they're collecting, devoted. Devoted to what? He says, keep away from the devoted, devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Then he goes on, he says, otherwise you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and the gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. Wow. Now, unfortunately, that's not what happened. The next verse says this. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Now, it's amazing, this word. What he's saying is this. The first fruits, the firstborn, the first things are sacred. They are devoted to God. They are consecrated. They are set apart. And if you touch them, there's going to be a curse come upon you. Now, when we talk about curse like this, we're talking about the kind of curse that removes the hand of blessing from your life. So he said, don't touch those things because if you do, you put me in a position where I can no longer bless you and my heart is to bless you. But if you violate this, I'm going to remove my hand of blessing. And if you know the story, Achan, just one dude, just one dude caused a curse to come upon the rest of the nation of Israel because he took the things that were devoted, consecrated, holy, set apart to God and God withdrew his hand of blessing and it's going to be a struggle from that day forward. Now, the message is a very clear one, and it's very easy to understand, really. The spoils, the consecrated things, the things that have been set apart to God are for God, are holy, are for his purposes, and when you take them, at least the message to Israel was this, you remove the hand of blessing on your life. Now, 
Because you and I, and I said this message is not merely about money. We're talking about the first of your talents, the first of your ability, the first of your time, everything, the first fruits of your life. But because you and I as Americans think more in monetary gain, I'm going to use a monetary example. We got some cash here, American dollar. And I've got 10 of them right here. Because we think in these terms, here's what the Bible is saying. It's saying, if you got $10 in your house, and you've made $10 in your salary. Let's say you make $10 a year. I'm sorry, first of all. Second, he said, but there's the one out of this 10 that is holy, that is consecrated, that is set apart to God. And it goes to God for the purpose of ministry. It's so set apart, holy, and sacred that if you found it in your house, you'd want to say, wait a minute, what is that doing here? That belongs to God. Let's get this where it belongs. Now, by understanding that is the way God looks at our resources, it helps us understand Malachi 3. And every pastor reads this when he wants to talk on tithing. He says, will a mere mortal rob God? Now you know what he means by robbing God. This is consecrated, set apart, doesn't belong to you, it belongs to God. And he said, you're robbing me. And you ask, how are we robbing you? And you say, in tithes and offerings. He says, you're under a curse. In other words, I want to open the windows of heaven and bless you. But I'm not going to because I'm not going to reward bad behavior. So you're under a curse, the whole nation, because you're robbing me. What belongs in my house is still in yours. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And God is a father who so desperately wants to bless his children and open up the windows of heaven so the floodgates will let go. But he says, in order for me to do this, you got to cooperate. Test me in this. Test me, please test me, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not keep my part of the bargain, if I will not throw enough into your lap and pour out so much blessing that there will be no room enough to store it. That's pretty powerful. Those are pretty big words. God says, I'm so intentional about blessing you in every area of your life, but I'm only going to bless those areas of your life where you give me the first fruits, the firstborn, the blessings, where you give me the first portions. Now, this is not a sermon of manipulation. Your salvation is free. It has nothing to do with this message. Jesus delivered you by his blood on the cross and you are saved. And you're going to be with God someday. You understand? That is not what this message is about. Your salvation is not about how much you give or giving God the first fruits of your life. It's not about, it's about what Jesus did on the cross and your journey toward Christ likeness. You understand? Common everyday blessings, God continues to pour down. That's not what this sermon is about. This sermon is about you. If you want God to pour down the blessings from heaven, if you want him to open the windows of heaven and bless your life in any particular area, it's about you giving the first things of God from that area so that he can rain down his blessings on you. A father wants to do that. The reason he won't do it when you're not adhering to first fruits, firstborn, first portions is because God will not become an enabler. Have you ever met a mother who's an enabler? It's not fun to watch, is it? You know, it's the little kid that screams and cries all the time because he knows that's the way he can manipulate his mom to get what he wants. And she becomes an enabler by always giving him what he wants when he screams and cries. Then he becomes a teenager and he comes to mom and he says, mom, you know, I'm, I'm smoking pot. I'm on other drugs. I know it's not good for me, but I really need it. And rather than saying, hey, son, if you're going to do that, you're out of my house. She says, oh, I understand. Life is tough. And you know, if that's, if that's what helps you, that's, you understand? That's called an enabler. That's why some kids end up living with their parents when they're 50 years old. Now, here's the good news. We've all had enabling mothers. My mother was an enabler. And I'm not afraid to say that because she's dead. <laughs> and here's what I'm telling you about God. God wants to open the windows of heaven and bless you. He loves you. He's already proven that by sending his son to die for you and secured your salvation through the blood of Jesus. He wants to pour out blessings on you, but he's not going to allow you to violate the first fruits principle and still open up the windows of heaven because he's not an enabler. You've been listening to Today with Jeff Vines. Thanks for joining us. Next time, we'll bring you the rest of this message from Pastor Jeff. If you want God to pour down 
the blessings from heaven. If you want him to open the windows of heaven and bless your life in any particular area, it's about you giving the first things of God from that area so that he can rain down his blessings on you. The reason he won't do it is because God will not become an enabler. You can listen to more messages like this. Just search for Today with Jeff Vines wherever you get your podcasts. You make me want to dance and sing With every single breath I breathe I will break this offering You are my wonder You are the wonder Today 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 with Jeff Vines. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.